Brickcast. I am your host, T Brick 475, and you are listening to episode 8 of the Brickcast. And this is being recorded the 10th of January 2015. So, want to get into real quick what I've been doing here in the last week as far as game wise. Been kind of messing around with a few different games, uh, been playing some more Evil Within. And that game, I put it on my best of 2014 list. Not a mistake. That is an excellent game. The more I play it, the more I like it. The only problem with it is it's one of those where it's intense. And then once you get into it, um, you don't want to get interrupted because if you have because you only get save points every so often. So you better not you know you better not get interrupted in the middle of the game. But very good. But when the kids are around, I've been playing some Peggle 2, which is pretty good. I liked the first Peggle a lot, but uh, I don't know. This one's not doing any doing anything real special for me, but, I, I mean, it's good. I think I'm just kind of done with Peggle. I don't care for it that much, but, it, but it's fun. Passes the time. And some Nidhogg. That game is a wild, is a wild game. It's pretty tough, but great for couch co-op if you have the if you're able to get it it was on sale here on the PA, uh, playstation network recently take a look at it; it's pretty good but uh anyway so before we get started i wanted to go ahead and go over a reader question from cradle to grave he wrote in earlier one of our previous episodes and uh, i'm going to go ahead and read his question here he says i realized something just recently about today's games that i'm mad and bummed about There are no more games these days where you can play offline with your friends against bots. I used to love playing 007 Nightfire on GameCube with friends. We would have sleepovers and stay up, stay up just playing that game all night. And all it was was deathmatch or team deathmatch with bots. Or even if I didn't have friends over, I could just play on my own in deathmatch against bots. If you get bored, you could always change the level, make the bots easier, harder. And change the weapon sets. So much fun. Um, Let's see. But those games don't seem to exist anymore. That's so frustrating to me because I would love to do exactly what I did with Nightfire. But with awesome modern graphics. Call of Duty as an example. So, do you know of any modern games that would let you do this? Uh, First person shooters with offline bot deathmatch play. Does this bum you out and make you frustrated as much as it does with me? I know that online gameplay is what's big now, and I may be kind of kind of behind the times, but tell me what you think. Cradle to grave. All right, so I ended up doing a little bit of research here because off the top of my head, I couldn't really think of what games have local multiplayer or with bots uh, that you're talking about, but there are some. Uh, this is just what I have found online, so I didn't check any of it, so I can't say for sure that this is all true, but I'm just telling you what I found in some different forums and stuff. Apparently, Black Ops, Call of Duty Black Ops 1 and 2 have, uh, modes where you can play against bots. Call of Duty Ghosts just came out last year, uh, or the year before that, I guess. Anyway, it had this, uh, squads mode where you could... You would play, and then you would equip your squad. You'd have, you know, like four or five bots, and then I think you could play against other people with their bots. Uh, But I don't remember if you could do it offline. I think you could, but uh, I mostly played it online. So I know when I had a friend come over, he and I, one of us would play as, you know, we we both get our own team of bots, and then we play against each other and stuff. So... Anyway, I'm not sure what all the options are there, but uh, check that out. It's probably right up your alley. Uh, Let's see. There's Perfect Dark uh, Zero, which is like one of the first Xbox 360 games. I'm sure it's terrible now, so you may not want to play that one. But they did do a remake of Perfect Dark on the Xbox 360 as a downloadable, and they uh, 
made the graphics a little bit better and stuff. So if you are really into that and you don't mind playing that old school style, then that might be one for you. Let's see. You know, this is one that just came to mind. I don't know, but they did a remake of uh, GoldenEye um, on, I think it was like PS3 and Xbox 360, um, and they kind of redid it with James Craig as the main character and stuff. I don't. They were kind of trying to harken back to that original 007 uh, GoldenEye game, so they may have it on there. I don't know. I never checked. But uh, let's see. Another one is Counter-Strike. I don't know if that's on Xbox 360. I know it's on PS3 because I was playing it on there. I haven't tried that, but that's what I heard. And uh, Counter-Strike, you know, is a a classic. So Um, let's see. Some people said Left 4 Dead 2 when you're not in versus mode. And then some for some older stuff, anything Unreal. Any of the Unreal games have it. I used to play Time Splitters. That was a couple of generations ago, though. So, but uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, I got some good memories uh, playing those games. I feel like a lot of a lot of times um, playing with bots was cool because we didn't have online multiplayer, and I could only get so many friends over at a time. So there'd be like two of us, and it's not nearly as fun to just go around with two, and then you know not have any bots. So. That kind of made that more fun. So I guess uh, I don't really miss that that much. It doesn't really frustrate me. I mean, I do get I do get frustrated when I play online just because I'm not very good. So I get my butt kicked all the time. But uh, I don't really find myself wishing that I had uh, bot mode. I did enjoy on Ghosts playing that uh, squads mode. So it was actually more fun than I thought it was going to be. So yeah, f- feel free to check that out. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe you know, I I don't know. Maybe there's uh maybe if there was a game that really focused on making that a good quality experience, I think probably not that many games focus on their offline bots and stuff like they used to. So, but uh, yeah. Anyway, that's kind of, that's how I feel about it. But uh, one last question to add for me is where did I get my Xbox One that was that's white? I got it in the Sunset Overdrive bundle that came out here a while ago, and I heard that they were pretty limited, so I don't know if they have many more. But, yeah, I got Sunset Overdrive and and the white console, which is pretty, pretty cool. I like how it looks. Um, Sunset Overdrive I liked a lot too, but uh, I was debating putting it on my Game of the Year list, but I hadn't really put enough time into it where I felt like I could give you a really good evaluation. But I... I did like it quite a bit. Anyway, so thank you, Cradle to Grave. Appreciate you sending in the questions here. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and uh, get up to the top news of the week, starting off with number one. So the Xbox One uh, has been had some of the CPU freed up for developers to be able to use to get a little more power out of it. Now, uh, from what I was reading on the IGN article, it was saying that uh, the seventh core of the CPU, which is uh, typically used for, let's see, what do they call it? Background system operations. Uh, they've been able to free up 50 to 80 percent of it. And but when you're, but when they do that, if the developer decides to utilize that for their game, then you're not able to do. Uh, voice commands or use connect so has some limitations there um you know i think this is cool i mean i i don't really i'm not really worried about the whole graphic graphical comparison between xbox one and ps4 i don't blame people for being upset about it or feeling like they got you know that irritates them but uh, I can't, I, you know, I haven't done a gra- direct graphics comparison. The, du- the ones I see online, I can't hardly tell the difference between the two anyway. So I, I don't see, any hu- see it being a huge issue. I mean, if, if uh, you know, if a game starts chugging, if it a frame- affects the frame rate and stuff, that might, that might bo- bother me, you know. But other than that, I, I'm not too worried about it. But this is cool. I mean, uh, give developers more options to do what they want to do, which is always a good thing in my mind. So anyway, so next thing, uh, number two, next few aren't necessarily game related, but, um, CES was this week 
And uh, if you don't know anything about CES, it's the, what is it, Consumer Electronics Show, I think. And uh, they just have a big old convention. They All these different uh, tech uh, companies get together and show off all their latest and greatest. And there was a lot of cool things. There's a lot of just strange things like that, you know, you don't, you wouldn't necessarily use, but are cool to look at and, and read about. And, uh, but, but one of these things, first one, very interesting. So number two is Sling has partnered, uh, with Xbox one, and they're going to be doing a new streaming service, uh, for $20 a month. Now this streaming service is uh is different than what we've seen with like Netflix or Hulu and hold on let me pull up a little bit uh okay so this is interesting because it's 20 bucks a month and you're going to be getting ESPN these channels ESPN TBS TNT CNN and Disney Channel for 20 bucks it sounds like there might be a couple other channels too but anyway there's no contract no strings attached um Anyway, so so they're going to have this service, and you don't have to have a box, like a set-top box or anything like that. It's just going to stream through your Xbox One and other devices. I don't know what all devices it's going to be. <clears throat> I, th- I think it said mentioned it in the article a little bit, but I didn't, uh, I didn't write it all down for the podcast. So, um, But so they're going to have live television, uh, like, you know, like regular cable. And I think they're partnered with DirecTV for this. But anyway, they're going to have live live programming. Uh, you're, there's going to be some limited functionality as far as fast-forwarding, rewinding, stuff like that. It doesn't have a DVR functionality necessarily uh, as far as I was understanding, but you can do that a little bit with certain things. There's also uh, some a la carte stuff so that you, you know, if you see, okay, they got episodes of this show and I can stream them whenever I want. And uh, they mentioned something about being able to watch content from three days prior. So I don't know exactly how all that's going to work, but it, it's intriguing. Um, it's also interesting. One reason this is such a big deal is because it's, it's news and sports. And cable companies have been holding on to those so tightly they don't want to give those up as far as uh, part of their cable packages or, or uh, satellite packages because that's how they, that's how they get you. Because a lot, you know, there's not really a comparable offering for that in the Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime space. So this is kind of the first uh, first time that that has been on the table for a streaming service without any contract. So it's interesting. It'll it'd be interesting to see how this affects. Uh, you know, this might be the, just the start of the end of traditional cable and satellite as we know it. I don't know, but. You know, my concern about all this is, you know, um, I think this is great. They're talking about how they might have in the future different packages, channel packages you can add on to Sling. So let's say they want to, you want an HBO channel along with it. They can slap that on there. But, you know, HBO is going to be doing their own service here anyway, their own streaming service. So they're already going into that direction. Or, But, you know, if there's other channels you want, they may slap those on in different packages and you just pay, uh, you know, five, 10 bucks a month for that extra package. So it's kind of interesting to see where this is all going. But one reason this bugs me is, uh, like for, I have charter internet and, uh, with my charter, they've been raising the speeds and raising the prices. And I don't necessarily, I mean, I've been doing speed tests. It says my internet's faster. I don't necessarily feel like it makes, when I was at 30 megabits per second, I don't know that it made a huge difference between that and when I'm at 60 megabits per second right now. But uh, anyway, so they keep raising the price. So now, you know, when I first started with my internet, it was way cheaper. It was like 30 bucks a month. And now it's up to 60 bucks a month. And that, uh, you know, they know that people are going away from traditional cable packages. You know, they, they know they're losing customers. So they start raising the prices on on all these, uh, on your internet service. And then, you know, eventually one of my fear is that we end up being just as expensive as every, you know, as if we would have had cable or satellite 
but uh, now we're just streaming everything. One advantage to that, though, is that you don't have a contract. We don't have any contracts right now, which I do feel good about. We can drop it whenever we want to. And in theory, you know, like with this sling, let's say that you decided you wanted to just get sports, uh, get sling during the sports season that, you know, you are into football. So you get it during the football season and then you drop it for the rest of the year. That's uh, that is an intriguing offer. So anyway, be interesting to see where that goes. Uh, so on to number three, Roku has announced that they're going to stream ultra HD, which is 4k, uh, video to Netflix in this spring. This is significant because I've been seeing the prices of 4k TVs go down significantly over the last six months. Um, you go to the store, they have very affordable as, as you know, compared to what they used to be, uh, you can get them for under a thousand, uh, I see a lot of them in the around thousand dollar to fifteen hundred dollar range, um, and seem like they're pretty decent. So that may uh, become a more viable option here soon. And you know, before I've never even considered getting a four K TV, but because there's no content coming in four K, um, you know, like so- Sony and them have already announced that they're not going to do video games in four K. They might be able to do video services in in 4k but so this is kind of uh this is an interesting because we're finally going to start seeing some content in 4k and get to see what that's actually like so uh yeah we'll see we'll see if other content providers start uh jumping on board here so on to number four uh there's there's been a lot of uh 3d printed there's a lot of uh, new 3D printed stuff coming out and 3D, new 3D printers. One of the things that they uh, were showing at CES was a 3D printer that was making 3D printed pizza. Now, I didn't really get a good look at uh, what that looks like or if, you know, is it, does it print it out raw and then you have to, and then you have to cook it? I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what, what the, how the heck they do this. But uh, they were showing all sorts of things that they were making. They were making shoes. They were making purses, um, robots. I mean, just all kinds of crazy stuff. And, you know, there's been talks about uh, using 3D printed things. I mean, they use, they, uh, use 3D printing to make guns, uh, parts, uh, automotive parts and stuff they've been looking into. I mean, all kinds of stuff. So it's interesting to see. It'll be interesting to see... Uh, how three three D printing continues to grow and become you know become more affordable, and you know how that might change our everyday lives. Where okay, I got my three D printer, and uh, let's say you know you you lose something a like a one example that I heard was you know you have a chess piece to your chess game and you lose it, well, then you might just be able to download a new design uh, for that chess piece and then print it out yourself for a few bucks. So it was kind of interesting, uh, the prospects there. But um, anyway, want to move on to my next seg- segment, What's Trending, where we talk about whatever I want. And uh, today I wanted to talk a lot about, uh, I wanted to talk about Greg Miller, Colin Moriarty, Nick Scarpino, and Tim Geddes of IGN. They announced this week that they are quit IGN and uh, their full-time jobs to pursue their side project, which is now their full-time job of uh, Kind of Funny. And Kind of Funny is like their own uh, internet videos. Um, They have a uh, Patreon. They're on Patreon, which is like a... um, Let's see, how do you explain this? It's sort of like... Paying, for, it's like a subscription-based uh, service for the content that you want. People can, you know, regular folks can get on there and say, okay, it's kind of like Kickstarter where you say, okay, I want to do this, and if you don't, if you uh, pledge this much per month, then you're going to get these benefits. Um, so they have some different Patreons they've started up between them. And uh, they're doing, they started their own, uh, let's see, 
kind of funny games channel on YouTube and on Patreon. So you can support, like if you want to support them doing their game stuff, uh, you can get on there and do that. And, uh, yeah, anyway, it's, it's, it's cool. I, I'm not a subscriber yet. I'm thinking about it. I might be doing it cause, uh, I really enjoyed those guys on IGN. They were some of my, uh, some of my favorite folks from there to listen to and to watch. And uh, always interesting to hear their opinions on different things. But, you know, they're not going away. They're, they have videos on Patreon. If you subscribe, you get to see all their videos up front. Um, but eventually they post everything else on, they post everything on YouTube. They also have a Twitch channel and different stuff. Um, one, the one thing I wanted to talk about this is first of all, because it's just, um, I guess it was a big deal to me when I heard this, I knew, I knew it was eventually going to come at some point because I kept thinking, you know, everybody at IGN eventually moves on to something. I, I think a lot of people at IGN seem to, uh, you know, they, they have successful career there and they want to get into something else. And these guys were, have been there for so long, I think. Uh, Colin and Greg had been there for eight years and I'm not sure how long Tim and Nick had been there, but I think it was, uh, pretty close to the same amount of time. And, um, they would do, they did different podcasts. They did, uh, the podcast beyond, which I was a big fan of and game scoop. They were, they frequented, frequented game scoop as well. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about it, and I have been listening to those podcasts for six years now. Every single week, I've been listening to those podcasts for six years. And uh, so it was a little bit of a, it was a little bit of a bummer. It was a little bit like, oh, man, I'm going to miss, I'm going to miss those podcasts. But, uh, but like I said, luckily, they're still going to be online, and I've been enjoying watching their content on, uh, on YouTube so far. And, uh, and I think it's just cool because, you know, when, when they said that they were doing this, I was reading some of the comments and of course you, you don't want to read the comments cause people will say all sorts of crazy stuff, but you know, people were saying they're not going to be successful in this and that. And, and I don't see why that would ever be the case. There are so many successful people on YouTube. Uh, you know, I don't see why they couldn't be very successful, um, doing what they're doing. You know, they may have to adjust their strategy at some point, um, but maybe not. I mean, it sounds like they're very successful the way they've been, the, they've been doing it. But, um, you know, there's there's tons of people that are successful on YouTube and other services where um, they make a whole, they make a living, a great living doing that. And um, so I wish them all the best and I am going to be following them and all their uh future exploits. Um, but, uh, anyway, so I've been, I tried to, I've been trying to expand the show a little bit. You notice I had some music at the beginning and I'm be having some at the end, I'm trying to change things up a little bit. Um, also talking about, you know, thinking about getting some more, trying to get interviews on here. Uh, I, I'm trying to get, it would be great to get some of these people from different outlets like IGN or, you know, the kind of funny guys or, um, other podcasters is another thing. I, I've been, uh, following different podcasters on, uh, Twitter. And so my plan is, I just want to let you guys know, I want to try to get some more people on here, hear some other opinions, maybe get some, uh, developers on here and hear what they have to say about their games or, uh, just, you know, get to converse with them a little bit and find out more about them. So that's kind of my plan here, and I'm and I'm been trying to line up a couple interviews, and uh, so we'll see how it goes. But I'm hoping, uh, hopefully, I'll have some success and be able to bring some uh, cool interviews to you guys, some cool content. But uh, thank you guys for listening; I really appreciate it. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to get a hold of me on Twitter at tbrick four seventy five. Or you can email me at tbrick at thebrickcast.com. And, uh, yeah, feel free to uh, subscribe to me on Stitcher and iTunes. And if you want to leave a review, go ahead and leave an honest review. Give me some feedback. If you think I need to improve on some stuff, let me know. I'll be keeping you updated and uh, see what kind of new content we'll be coming out with. So thank you very much and have a wonderful day. I'm out. (laughs) 